Good afternoon. I'm Karen Merrill, LCSW with Reliant Behavioral Health, and I've had the pleasure to present to you a number of these Lunch and Learns. And today we're going to be looking at the topic of working in a changing environment. There'll be polling questions interspersed throughout the presentation, and we'll try to leave some time at the end for question and answers. Also attached to this PowerPoint presentation at the, uh, you'll see over to the side, there are a couple of handouts attached that you can reference if you like. And then after the presentation, uh, Brenda, our trustee assistant, will be sending all attendees a copy of the PowerPoint as well as the handouts. So um, let's get started. So ever feel like this? like your teeth are right on edge or you just want to scream to relieve stress workplaces today can elicit these kinds of responses and many others so our learning objectives today will be to explore the challenges of living in our changing world we'll make the case that actually change or transition provides us with uh, opportunity for learning and growth. We'll look at some common responses to change and what roles people take on. And then we'll provide tools and suggestions to learn to build resiliency for better health and personal satisfaction. So why this particular discussion and why now? Change has been happening at an accelerated pace throughout the world, our country, and our communities, and certainly within businesses and industry. Change has moved from episodic to continuous, which we'll talk more about. And we really do need some personal tools to help move us through the transitions caused by change. We don't look need to look any farther than the 24-hour news stream information that we're constantly bombarded with that's at our fingertips. News shows in form of natural disasters, heinous criminal acts, economic conditions. We've experienced many of these right in a row in the last few weeks. So we need to build ourselves a psychological track for safety for the train we're on. In large part, the continuous change is caused by rapid changes in technology and the need for changes throughout the world to keep up. It almost seems like our values are changing as a result. But still, regardless of these fast-paced significant changes around us, there are tools to utilize to not only get us through these experiences, but for us to grow through these changes. So a word on the, the changing nature of change. In the past, decades ago, a few decades ago, there was a certainty to change, kind of a stepwise process. We knew it was coming, we could plan for it, we could move through it, and then we could actually adjust to it. In the last few decades, most recently the last couple, there's an uncertainty about change. It's almost warp speed, a warp speed. It keeps coming one right after another. So it can put us kind of um, on the edge of our seat about that. So our first polling question. One reason people dislike change is that they fail to see the possibility of positive outcomes, true or false. So Brenda will we'll give a few guys a few minutes or a couple minutes and then we'll see how you vote on this question. So Karen, it looks like we have 89% of participants voting for true and 11% voting for false. Perfect. 
Yeah, it and that it, it is true. We can get caught in all these other um, other things rather than the kind of mask the possible positive outcomes. So why do we resist change? Why do people dislike change? Makes us feel our lives are out of control, which uh, is unnerving. We like to feel control. There's fear that we'll fail to adapt. Um, these areas of uncertainty actually kind of translate into danger or the unknown. People like routine. We like a predictable uh, pattern of habits. And change disrupts that. Things are up in the air. Uh, and then we cannot understand the rationale and get caught there. And then this last one, what the question alludes to, is that we fail to see the possibilities and instead get distracted by the problems. So more about change, and, and I think this is particularly poignant now for the, for the time we're living in. We have these interacting circles of change. We have changes in our society, in the world, what's going on. We have changes within our organization, restructuring, layoffs, new protocols. And then our own lives, um, our families, the health, financial, all those things affect um, the interaction with other areas of change. So it's not just one specific area, um, it's, it's a number of areas. And why? Why people react differently because they're reacting to many different things. So our polling question number two, change is actually good for us, true or false? So we have 100% voting for true. Yay. <laughs> Good job. It is true. Uh, you know, we need some amount of stress or stimulus to move us forward. Otherwise, we can feel stagnant um, and, and uncreative. So some change um, is, is good for us. The question is how much change kind of unsettles us or knocks us off balance. Um, researching psychologists really have found that um, the, our responses to change are the biggest stressors in America because they come at us from, from so many areas. And some of the biggest changes are um, death of a spouse, divorce, retirement, positive changes can be stressful. Pregnancy, promotion, um, you know, positive achievements, and then global changes, health issues, financial issues. Some of you may be familiar with something called the Holmes Ray Social Adjustment Scale. It's a tool that does an assessment on the number of changes that have occurred in our lives. It attaches a certain number figure and you add it up and it tells us how vulnerable we may be um, for, for change. So little change is good. It's when so many changes, um, you know, kind of go one on top of another that can unsettle us. So kind of now, you know, zeroing in on workplace change and why that's difficult. It triggers questions and doubts, uh, our usefulness. How useful will we be to the organization once all said and done? And all said and done sometimes looks like until the next change. Uh, how flexible are we? And this is personality, partly. It's, you know, what kind of our nature is like. Our sense of security around losing our job, thinking about what other things we could or would be able to do, and can we keep up? So 
there it it calls into question some very basic things that really in some ways have to do with our survival around will we have a job and can we you know take care of our families and all of those things so um they're very it's very real the fears and uh, anxieties that that are triggered in us with workplace change nonetheless you know the train's not going to stop we're not going to be able to turn back that clock to predictable kinds of changes it's only going to accelerate so you know we have choices we can learn to master change strengthen our resiliency or become victims and um, become unhappy and um, not be able to adjust so we talk about change and transition almost in an interactive way but there really is a difference so we're going to talk about this next change is what i call the activating event change is a shift in the external so that is the restructuring or the change in job or the move from one city to another that's the activating event externally the transition is the psychological or internal shift that we make in response to the change of course it takes much longer it's a process it really always starts with an with an ending or a loss if we look at that as what has changed and then the ending or that activating event is closely followed by a long period of uncertainty and unfamiliarity that is that middle ground that creates fear but this is also where the opportunity lies to learn more um, about our uh, about our place and about ourselves so man named william bridge uh, has created or did work on what he calls the transition model um, not unlike other kind of you know models around working through change or loss so starts with an ending which is that change then that long neutral zone you know kind of in the middle and then the new world the beginning so um, it's kind of creates a framework for the process so this neutral zone it's that in between time one side and another actually one personal identity or another or one way of doing things or another things are up for grabs what may develop hasn't it's unclear it's ambiguous we can do that self-questioning or self-doubt oftentimes what used to work doesn't work anymore and what is to be isn't in place so we can feel empty we can feel unfamiliar we can also feel creative depending on how we look at things or our personality in terms of the possibilities but it definitely challenges our ability to stay centered balanced and to tap into our our core strength how do we manage the shifting ground so this neutral zone uh, you know Marilyn Ferguson another researcher on the area of change and transition says it's not so much we're afraid of the change or we're so in love with the old ways it's that place in between that we fear it's like being in midair between two trapezes it's linus when his blankets in the dryer there's nothing to hold on to and as human beings we you know we want um re reliability and something to hold on to so that's the difficulty so polling question three signs of transitional stress include all of the following except we can feel sick even flu-like symptoms we can blame others 
we can reach out to others, or we can feel angry. So what are your thoughts about that? So it looks like we have 45% uh, voting for A, feeling sick. Uh huh. 43% voting for B, extending blame to others. 73% uh, uh -huh. voting for C, reaching out to others. And 37% uh -huh. voted for D, feeling angry. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, you're you're on target. It. Um, what we're unlikely to do in terms of reacting to transitional stress is is reach out to others we're more likely um, as one of the behavioral signs uh, to withdraw so also physically i mean we can feel just about anything in terms of physical symptoms i mean we can feel muscle soreness we can feel dizzy certainly uh, sleep issues we can you know, feel thirsty or dry. Um, we can um, feel any of those physical symptoms. Definitely thinking and cognition can be affected, can be hard to make a decision. We pray to make a decision. And so we um, get paralyzed in that area. We can be confused. We can be blameful. We can feel um, overwhelmed. Um, any number of things. And then certainly emotionally is where we feel anxiety or fear or depression. Our family members or even co-workers may, may tell us that we're, we're more irritable than usual um, or feel angry. So you can feel any number of um, emotional issues. And then withdrawing or changing in, act, in activity. People that you know, religiously exercise can stop doing that or can be changes in appetite, eating more, eating less, um, drinking more alcohol or have emotional uh, outbursts. Any number of things can show up. And I think what's important really is it's all about knowledge and information and the awareness that these things can be impacted can make us less scared about what may be happening to us, but also a reminder about how important it is to take care of ourselves. So as we move through this, and again, with more knowledge and preparedness, in order to make the transition it's good to have information about what are we giving up? What is the loss? And to be able to identify and recognize the crisis to us uh, before we're able to look at the opportunities. So instead of running from it or denying it, that we look at, oh, it's because I had these relationships that I'm going to miss in this organizational move or whatever that is, but being able to point to it um, gives us uh, impetus to be able to move forward. So how do we live in this neutral zone? How do we, um, how do we manage this? Setting some short-term goals to give us more of a sense of control. What do I want to accomplish today? but having a long-term vision of you know, possibly those positive opportunities or outcomes. Knowing that through this change, you'll take risks because you're learning new information and that you're going to make mistakes along the way. Rediscovering old talents, maybe thinking of old hobbies that um, provided satisfaction 
is a good thing to think of now in terms of another use of energy. Learning new stuff um, triggers our brain. Cultivating relationships is really important because we need each other uh, during these times. People that you share information with and that you feel safe with. Taking breaks and distracting ourselves so that the focus isn't constantly on what the change is, but you know, kind of making that energy uh, go in different directions. And another thing that uh, I would add to this list is cutting, you know, cutting ourselves some slack. Cut yourself some slack. Be your own good friend and have compassion because, again, this is, you know, this is unknown territory and mistakes will be made and risks will be taken. So um, being, you know, kind to yourself around this and to others around you is important. So four common responses that people make in modes to change. You know, we can um, act as a victim. We can be the critic. We can stand by and let things happen. Or we can choose to navigate, navigate in this change. And these aren't you know, carved in stone. Our roles and our responses can change from situation to situation. We might feel um, a victim at one point and a navigator in another. So um, again, kind of having this information can be really helpful. And I'll ask that as we go through each of these modes in the following sl slides, to take note of any responses with which you can identify. Oh, that's me, I can do that. Um, and when we get to what the what to do section, then taking note of ideas which you may think can be remedies for any of our counterproductive response modes. Uh, keep on the lookout for that as well. So if we see ourselves in the victim mode, we can be resistant, we can feel angry, depressed, we can try to revert to the old ways of doing things, we can isolate ourselves, and we can fail to ask for help or fail to reach out to others. You know, an attitude might look like, why me? Why is this happening to me? Feeling targeted. And why can't things stay as they are? In other words, you're resisting that change. The critic will look for reasons why change will be unsuccessful really failing to see any positive outcomes or challenging it. Is this really necessary? An attitude of this hasn't worked in the past. I don't know why it'll work now. Or I doubt that this change will improve anything. It's taking the role of a critic and trying to hold back that inevitable tide that it's going to happen. A bystander shows reluctance to get involved at all, takes a passive role, waits for others to make decisions and take the lead. An attitude uh, assigned to this might be, if I ignore this change, it'll go away. It won't happen if I just ignore it. Put a blanket over my head. I won't jump in until others have shown me it's safe. I'll wait until more experienced people have paved the way. That's what the bystander does. Another way of you know, really avoiding uh, the inevitable that it's gonna happen. So what does a navigator do? I guess a navigator really takes more of a leadership role, uh, looks at ways to minimize the negative, explores the causes or reasons and tries to get information for that, looks at ways to be useful and supportive in the environment, looks at opportunities and uh, puts energy into forming nurturing relationships to help navigate the change. It's a different attitude, you know, it's kind of the half full approach that this change presents opportunities to do things differently. 
it's a chance to make things better. And I'm bound to make mistakes, but I'm going to learn from them. So the navigator takes this role. So another polling question. The stages of moving through transition are different than classic stages of grief, true or false. So we have 27% voting for true and 71% of participants voting for false. Okay. Well, actually, um, the changes of moving through transition are pretty similar to those of the stages of grief in terms of, um, you know, denial and bargaining and anger and then acceptance. I mean, it really is a very similar way of um, experiencing and looking at, at loss and how we move through that and how we recover. And I guess that kind of what's important about that is that the tools we use are very similar um, as, we, as we move forward to talking about exactly now kind of what are the do's and don'ts here that we need to be aware of. So what not to do, what to avoid. We need to not think somebody else will reduce our stress for us, that we give that responsibility to somebody else, that we, you know, kind of plant our feet in the, uh, in the sand and say, we're not going to change or to take that victim role to try to play a new game by the old rules. That's not going to work anymore. Trying to control the uncontrollable, and we'll talk a little more about that later, how that is a way of using up energy that you can use elsewhere. Or by the same token, failing to abandon the expendable, You're using energy on things that really aren't that important slowing down, thinking you can play it safe, pulling back and minimizing the risk. These are things to avoid. Being afraid of the future, um, you know, trying to just resist that what's coming. Picking the wrong battles can be um, a misuse of energy. Or psychologically unplugging from your job, just kind of you know, going through the motions and not really experiencing it. Avoiding new assignments, trying to, you know, go to the back of the line when assignments are given so that you can avoid um, the challenge of learning something new and trying to eliminate uncertainty and instability. These will just kind of stall that process of getting to, you know, the new beginning to the, what the new world is going to look like. So what should we do? First and foremost, we have to take care of ourselves. If we neglect the self-care that we need to build resilience, everything else will be much harder. We, we, we know that uh, intuitively. So taking care of yourself, Actively seeking out the information you need, uh, questions that you may have, and you know, talking with people, go-to people around who may have those answers. Not speculation, but is there a place where you can get some information that helps clarify for you to understand it as best you can? Sometimes we can't. You know, we reach that block where we have to accept something without totally understanding the rationale. But getting information can be helpful. Being empathetic to others, remembering that everybody's in the same boat, that people learn at different speeds, 
And if we think back to those interactive kind of stress circles that we looked at at the beginning, that maybe our coworkers' personal lives are bringing more stress to them than we realize, which is accounting um, for their behavior. So being empathetic and um, compassionate about that and educating ourselves about the process of moving through transition or that grief model. So understanding how that neutral zone uh, and, its, and its perils um, can, is, is normal, that it's normal to feel frustrated, out of control, adrift. The more information we have, the better um, you know, insulated we can feel. What else can we do when so much is uncertain and feeling like shifting ground, doing things that help us feel in control, how, whatever that is, you know, getting up at the same time every morning, choosing to use the few moments of first moments of your day, meditating or <clears throat> setting some goals for the day, you know, charting a course in the beginning of the day where you feel in control compartmentalizing work problems so that you minimize the you know, impact that it can have on your family and social life. In other words, you know, taking off that hat, the work hat, and putting on your family hat uh, or your friend hat so that you can um, provide energy there. And protecting your leisure time and you know, scheduling that in and your family, and knowing that the increased pressures and demands affect or workloads, they show up in how we interact with our family and our friends. And they're going to affect all of us because we, we interact with others. So being aware of that too, and listening to the feedback that others may uh, give us about that. So um, our last polling question, polling question five, roadblocks to moving through transition include all of the following except getting stuck in rumors, telling silly jokes, failing to acknowledge the loss, and toughing it out alone. So uh, we'll wait for your feedback on this one. Okay, so for polling question five, we have 18% voting for A, getting uh -huh. stuck in rumors, 2% for B, telling silly jokes, 20% for C, failing to acknowledge a loss, and 22% voted for D, toughing it out alone. Okay, so um, the, the one that isn't the roadblock is actually telling silly jokes. It actually it's helpful to tell silly jokes because it lightens it lightens things up. Um, humor uh, is extremely important, um, and you know, sharing a joke uh, can be extremely helpful in reducing stress. So um, that's the that's the answer to that one. So other tips for relieving stress. You know, we all we all have all been exposed to the benefits and information about deep breathing and remembering to do that when we're feeling stressed. When we breathe from our upper chest or shallow breathing, it provides less, less oxygen to the brain and so we can feel more anxious. It's those deep, you know, belly breaths that um, make us more relaxed. Visualizing positive outcomes are very powerful. You know, what do you want the outcome of this change to look like? Scheduling time to relax. We, we're, 
you know, oftentimes driven by schedules. And so adding those things uh, are important. Exercise is a great way of bleeding off stress and toxins and raising our serotonin. So whatever that is for you um, uh, it is important to include. Lots of good research on interactions with animals. We pet animals and our blood pressure goes down, their blood pressure goes down. So um, if you have one, uh, spend time with it. If not, you know, you know, volunteer or spend time with friends, animals and dogs or cats that can be helpful. Celebrate, send yourself flowers for, for managing this transition. You know, re remembering things our mother told us, good nutrition, eating well, you know, kind of limiting alcohol consumption. Whatever we like that we think is fun. Retail therapy, a little bit of shopping, bowling, golfing, movies, play, concert, getting away for the weekend, getting enough sleep, reaching out to the EAP when you need to. That's exactly what it's there for is in times of stress or transition. And you may see that what all of these have in common is it's a diversion or activities very different from um, what's happening in terms of stress and the change resulting in it. So uh, good things to keep in mind always. So roadblocks to uh, moving through the change. Um, applying the fundamental uh, attribution error. If we were in the room together, I'd ask you uh, what you think that is. But since I can't, then really what, what that is, is attributing a change really to personalities, what people are like, uh, rather than objective reasons. So uh, applying that rather than really getting information about it. Getting stuck in rumors, speculation, blame. We know we're, we've all experienced workplaces as changes occur and people, you know, gossiping about it and participating in toxic conversations. We think this is a way of bonding and sharing with others, but it can really do nothing but you know, exacerbate or, or make our anxiety um, uh, at a higher level. So being mindful of that and uh, cultivating relationships that are, that are more positive. Other roadblocks, as we talked before, is failing to acknowledge what the loss is. Um, trying to tough it out or going it uh, alone are ways of, of hitting a roadblock or escaping in, in unhelpful ways. We need to acknowledge our accomplishments and our successes, as small as they may be, because that can be helpful. And forgetting to laugh. You know, uh, sometimes there's just humor in things that are uh, nonstop chaotic and whatever, and that can be really helpful to us to um, get that good and recalibrate ourselves that way. It's important. So I like to, to look at this energy grid, which is a way of mapping what we have control over, what we don't have control over, um, what's important and what's not important. So there are things that we have control over that we can change that are important. There are things that, that we have control over that aren't so important. There are some pretty important things that we have absolutely no control over. So we have a uh, certain amount of physical and psychic energy that X with the energy available. And if we waste our time and energy on those boxes that have to do with what we don't have control over or what's not important, it robs us of the uh, productive energy that we're going to need for those areas that we do have control over. So as we kind of wind down here, some 
other tips for developing resiliency. Don't sweat the small stuff. You know, most of what we worry about is really annoyances rather than um, things that um, are really important. Um, so um, accepting what we, what we can't change and putting our energy into what we do have control over. Learning from what and what hasn't worked in the past. You know, we, we don't need to keep trying to go back to the old idea if it didn't work before. There's no reason it's gonna work now. So learning from the past about what worked. How are we looking at this? What is our interpretation or our perception? Are we looking at this rationally or are we thinking about it in a distorted way? How might somebody else look at it? Or how might else we look at it? Avoiding those judgment words like should and ought and must, all that will do is oftentimes lead us to feelings of guilt and frustration. So watching that self-talk, you know, how we how we talk to ourselves about what's going on. And again, looking at change and opportunity for self-growth and learning, keeping a sense of humor, remembering how important that is, um, and reaching out to the others and um, the employee assistance program when, when, when you feel like you would like to talk to somebody objective, it's what it's there for. So thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm hoping you'll take some of these tools we talked about, even if they're reminders for, um, for things to keep in mind as you move through transition.